probably tonight sometime, it'll be a whole different scene. Josh, we keep you prayed up, brother. Now that's what Acts does. And by the way, Matt uh, Pearson does all that he does about running the radio programs and TV programs and Facebook and everything. Now YouTube out of the Plaza Towers and manages the office. And he doesn't get a salary. He works nights. And the nights that he's not on his regular job, he's driving for Uber and maybe Lyft, I don't know. Yeah, both of them. That's what Axe does. Serving where needed. Huh? Doing the right thing. Serving where needed. Serving where needed, which was the motto I gave Axe, and then Jim Wining added, doing the right thing. So that's what it's about, isn't it? Well, I, I won't keep you long today with this message. I, uh, I, I'll cover some things that later on in another service, I'll take more time and really go into some of this. But I want us to notice in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, this is a precious, wonderful story about the activities, the ministry, and the teachings of our Lord Jesus. Beginning Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70, that is, Jesus appointed 70 others, and sent them on ahead of him in pairs, that is, two by two, to every town and place where he himself intended to go. It's very significant here that Jesus had a plan of where he was going to be, where he wanted to go, where he wanted to minister. And he selected 70 men, we assume they were men, probably so, to travel together, and sent them in pairs, that is, two by two, ahead of him into every place where he himself intended to go. Now, I think Jesus is still the planner. I think Jesus is still the organizer. And I think Jesus still has a plan about reaching a remnant in this world. And I think Jesus is still organizing some folks to do that very job. I want to be in that organization. I don't want to be up in the stands just watching the game. I want to be in the game. I can't think of anything much more exciting. Now, I need to explain here. Maybe I should use the word motivating or uplifting because excitement, X means from the outside. So excitement is something that you experience if you're a baseball fan or a football fan. Enthusiasm is something different. Enthusiasm comes from the inside comes from the Greek words in thos, meaning God in us, God stretching us. And I can't think of a better stretching feeling than to be in the game that Jesus has planned and be a part of his organization. I cannot fathom what was going through the minds of those 70 when Jesus himself commissioned them. I, uh, I remember what it was like when I was ordained the first time by a major denomination. Two bishops, and in that particular denomination, bishops were as big as you could get. Two bishops laid hands on me. And I know the feeling I've had, though, over the years when I have anointed many men and women and laid hands on them and uh, ordained them to be ministers of the gospel under the umbrella of Acts ministry. There's something very special about sending someone or being the one who sent. None of that could possibly compare to what these men felt when Jesus looked over there and said, Bob, Marty, I'm pairing the two of you up you're going to go ahead of me and I'll tell you where to go. And he looks back there and he says, now we can use the father and son team, so Matt and Bruce, uh, I'm pairing you up, I'll tell you later where you're going. 
if you could have had that personal experience with Jesus of being sent. Now, mind you, most of these men probably had ladies, wives and daughters. And so Judy would be watching, Nancy would be watching, the, the, the ladies would be watching as their men go off on this brand new journey. Now, verse 2, it says, He said to them, The harvest is plentiful. In other words, there's still a lot of folks out there, but the laborers are few. Now, there's a big harvest. You're just a few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Some of you may have seen um, how the West was won. It's been on TV, played and played and played and replayed many, many, many times. In the course of the unfolding of the winning of the West as a part of the United States of America, civil war intervened a little bit. And um, there were those who went off to war carrying only the kind of provisions that a wife or mother would pack for them and say, here's a little sack of food, and they wave them goodbye to go off and fight. Basically, that's what's happening here. But Jesus said, carry no purse, <laughs> no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. This is a very pointed kind of direction into a mission field. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. For the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town, as people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. If you are one, as many Christians are, sort of at a loss as to how and what to say to a potential Christian who has not yet got on the bandwagon of believers. You can use kingdom terminology. Generally speaking, nowadays, there's a lot of discussion among folks outside the walls of the church and sometimes within the walls of the church. But when you're outside there, you're going to hear a lot of political discussion. And they're talking about, well, so-and-so is building this, building that, and so forth. Uh, you can always talk to them in kingdom terms. Like, there is another kingdom, and uh, the Democrats have nothing to do with it, and Republicans have nothing to do with it, the Independents have nothing to do with it, the Libertarians have nothing to do with it, uh, and so forth. The Constitutional Party has nothing to do with it. It's called the kingdom of God. And God is on the throne and Jesus is seated at his right hand. You, that ought to be easy enough to begin talking to them about kingdom. But you need to know some kingdom principles if you're going to talk to them about the kingdom. And that's why in just a little bit, I'm going to give you the process of salvation. Listen to this then. Even the dust of your, t of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. That's whenever they enter a town and uh, they don't welcome you. Then you just go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. You yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. So you don't have to worry about hanging in there until you finally win the argument. You present the case, they either receive it or they don't. The kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. We do not have the obligation of talking people into the kingdom. We have the obligation to expose the kingdom. And then the rest is up as a matter between them and God. So it's not a matter of them rejecting you. 
if they, they're really rejecting God. Bruce, I remember you've told many times about the Holy Spirit's turning you around and had you go into a bar up here on Highway 13. Yep. Because somebody in there needed Jesus. You didn't get an immediate response, but you did your job. The rest was up to those people. It was a matter between them and God. So if they rejected you, they weren't rejecting you. They really were rejecting God. Folks, it's so simple. Let's live the kingdom. Let's be the kingdom. Let's, let's serve where needed. Let's do the right thing and receive the direction of the Holy Spirit, expose people to the kingdom, then the rest is between them and God. Amen. Now, all of this is the tip of the iceberg as to what God has in mind for those that will respond to a kingdom invitation. It's called salvation. God has a process for that. I'm going to present it to you quickly, and then another time I'll go into some detail. But salvation really means deliverance. So that people get delivered from here to here. From one place in life to another place in life. From even from one cultural influence into another cultural influence. Being delivered out of being steeped in the ways of the world and the sins of the world into the ways of the kingdom and the behavior of the kingdom. It is a deliverance process from here to here. The Apostle Paul said, work out your salvation daily and do it with fear and trembling. Now, I recognize that we have some groups that think that, well, you get saved, and that's the end of the story. Or you get saved, and that's the beginning of the, of the new story, but you're not doing anything after that. Uh, I, I disagree with that. I think that some people get saved and stuck. And maybe they, they made a decision at one time, and then they didn't really follow through to be followers of Christ. And I could read to you in here where Jesus said, if anybody is really going to be a follower of me, they will do what I tell them. Salvation is a process made possible because Jesus put in place in the courts of heaven something called justification. That's a legal term. The just shall live by faith. We are saved by our faith. We are justified by our faith. Jesus put in place in the courts of heaven justification. And he is our intercessor. He's our intermediary. So justification has been put in place as a part of salvation. He did that because the world was lost because of the sin in the garden. Jesus came and redeemed all of those promises. We are a part of that redemption process. I don't know if any of you remember the days of uh, s and green stamps, but if you could get a book full of those, they were, you could trade them in, you could redeem the stamps for merchandise. Jesus is our redeemer. He not only put in place in the court of heaven a justification process so that we're not found guilty of our sin, but he redeemed us. He made this possible by giving himself to buy us back. In that process of us participating in redemption and not rebelling against it, but cooperating with redemption, then we become reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. So reconciliation is a part of the process of salvation, that we become reconciled. We're no longer enemies of God, but we become friends of God, even more so than David, who was called the friend of God. We are reconciled to God so that there is peace that exists between God and us. Therefore, the original intent that God had for us when we were brought into the world, remember, he knew us even before we were in our mother's womb. The original intent has been restored. Salvation is a restorative process. 
Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, well, how can a man, when he's old, go back into his mother's womb and come out and be born again? And Jesus had to explain to him what he meant. The new birth has to do with us being totally restored to the position in God that we had when, before we were even in our mother's womb. I don't think you understand that it's not just a case of restoring us to back to when we were five years old and, and fairly innocent or six years old. This is, a, this is a restoration process that goes all the way back when we were just in the mind of God, being restored as to God's purpose. When this revelation came to me, it was like life-changing. Jesus didn't die and set up a new deal in the courts of heaven and redeem me back and make this process of salvation so that, that uh, I'd be cooperative with him, be reconciled and all that, just so I could be six years old again. No, I'm more new than that. By the time I was six, I had enough scars to go around. I could share some. You probably did too. Nowadays, it's certain that by the time a child gets to be six years old, they have an abundance of scars. If I wanted to play psychologist here and start talking with you back and forth, digging deeper and deeper and deeper, it's amazing the amount of dirt and grime and corruption that would come out that happened before you were six years old. In fact, we would be amazed at some of the influences that were wrought upon us when we were still prenatal, I call them prenatal influences. There's a reason why thinking mothers play Christian music to babies in the womb. There's a reason why thinking moms and dads lay hands on the child through the mother's, by laying hands on the mother's tummy and praying or reading scripture to an unborn child. Prenatal influences are very real. You see, when God restores us, He takes us back beyond that. His restoration isn't partial. It's complete. It's total. With this new birth thing that we cooperate in and begin living this life, this life of reconciliation, redemption, justification, and now restoration, Every day becomes like a new day. Every day we are brand new in the, in the mind of God. Every day we're like we were in, in His mind before we were in the mother's womb. That gives me great hope. I don't have to just go back to being five or six years old or four or two and a half. I don't have to go back to when I, I remember when I was 18 months old and, and fell off of a teeter-totter and broke his left arm. I remember that. It goes back beyond that goes back beyond that 8 by 10 little room that I was born in. goes back when I was in the mind of God. That's worth shouting about. That's worth writing home about. So we have that as a part of this process of salvation. I just wanted to enlarge our thinking beyond the idea of being saved and then stuck. I conclude with this. You may be thinking what you are advocating will require a great deal of work. True. Faith without works is dead. You can believe everything I told you, but if you don't work it, it's dead on the vine. It's DOA, dead on arrival. And you think, well... I'm just not up to it. I don't have all that it takes. Have you heard about grace? It's been preached and preached and preached. It's God's unmerited favor. God's favor that we don't deserve, but Jesus does. But God's grace will enable us to continue in this process. And then finally, even beyond that, Jesus said, I have to go away. Because if I don't go away, I can't send you the other comforter who can be with you all the time as a new guide. I've seen uh, some people have by their front door a little sticker that says, this house 
is guarded by paraclete security. They happen to be Christians who know that paraclete was the Greek word for the Holy Spirit. So even beyond grace, God takes another step. And he said, here's Holy Spirit, my spirit, the spirit of my son even, to be with you and teach you and guide you. And he not only does that, but then he provides gifts. The Holy Spirit doesn't come empty handed. He doesn't come with just advice. I don't know, but I can remember some, when I had some very trying times and I was a little weary of getting advice. I needed some gifts. And you may have been there too. You needed more than just an, an advice. So the Holy Spirit doesn't come empty handed. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and you'll find that there are nine gifts that the Holy Spirit brings to help us in this process of salvation. He brings us wisdom and knowledge. He brings us faith, he brings us healing, he brings us miracles, he brings us discernment, he brings us prophecy, he brings us tongue, tongues, and he brings us the interpretation of tongues. When it comes to tongues, there's nothing in the scripture that says you have to speak in tongues to be in the process of salvation. This is some of the icing on the cake. There's nothing in the scripture that says everybody that says they speak in tongues are really speaking in tongues. There's nothing in the scripture that says that just because a person stands up every Sunday night in their church and they can be depended on to give a message in tongues and another person is always there to give the interpretation, there's nothing in the scripture that says that that's always real. The same thing is true about the gift of wisdom. Just because somebody says, I have the gift of wisdom and here's what I'm telling you, may not necessarily make it so. Remember, in this whole array of gifts, one should stand out big time. The gift of discernment. So that we will not be deceived by fakery. I rest my case. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I praise you. I worship you. I give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And I admit that I love you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you help all of us to persevere in this process of salvation and be so interested in it that we'll begin to study it in your word. And then we will study it by listening to the teachings of the Holy Spirit. And then we will begin to experience it more and more as we accept willfully gifts from the Holy Spirit. And I thank you that we are all in this together with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, it's time for us to have prayer meeting. Are you ready for a prayer meeting? Come on down, and Nancy will, will anoint people, and I'll lay hands on, and so will some others, and, and we'll believe God for the miracle you need or that your neighbor needs. You can always, you can always uh, stand in for your neighbor. So let's gather down the front.